And if it slows my computer down too much, I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I have not gotten much opportunity uh, to teach to a room of adults before. Uh, I spend most of my time doing either private lessons in chess or lectures for groups of kids under 10. So uh, I thought this was a fun opportunity, opportunity for me to do something a little different and also a chance for a lot of my friends and family uh, who often say, oh, I, you know, I, I'd like to learn chess sometime to kind of put their money where their mouths are and uh, give it an actual shot because Lord knows we've all got time. Um, so we're going to be looking today at uh, a game that is incredibly famous and uh, in the chess world is probably one of the first games that you will see, which is the opera game. Okay, and um, the opera game was uh, a game played between Paul Morphy, who uh, hopefully, is everybody able to see my screen right now? How's the share screen working? Yeah, okay, thumbs up, awesome. Yep, so good. Paul Morphy. Good to go. Excellent. <clears throat> so Paul Morphy is this guy, I'll get into him in a minute. Um, it's a game between Paul Morphy and two noblemen, two rich guys who are amateurs, um, the Duke of Brunswick, and a guy, Count Izuard, who um, has, you know, probably one of the best names uh, in chess history, Count Izuard. So um, the Duke and the Count are not terribly important to chess history. They're just two rich guys. Um, like rich people throughout history, they like to associate themselves with famous talent, right? And so they end up having this game with Paul Morphy in the Paris Opera House during the opera, um, but it's really Paul Morphy that's of interest to me here. So who, who was this guy? Um, Paul Charles Morphy, as you see, I've got the Wikipedia article up here. I'm not going to just read it to you because, but um, he was a child prodigy, prodigy. He was from New Orleans, Louisiana, and he first demonstrated his chess ability when he was probably eight or nine years old, and he was watching his father and his uncle play chess. They had like a weekly chess game they used to play all the time and Paul would sit next to them. He was never allowed to play and watch. And uh, one day his father resigned in a bad position and Paul asked, hey, um, can I keep playing for you? Because I don't think you're lost. His father had, you know, total shock, but said, yeah, sure, right? If you can make anything of it. And Paul was able to come back in the game and beat his uncle, who was actually a reasonably strong chess player in the New Orleans chess scene, right? So from the age of probably 10, he was already um, a local, right? What is this? The age of nine, he was considered to be one of the best players in the city. And at 12, right, Johan Lowenthal visits the city and plays Paul and he beats him. So this, you know, he's one of the, the real amazing sensations of American chess. There are really only two people who have ever been called the best in the world who were American. The other name probably everybody here knows is Bobby Fischer. And that's not until 1972. Morphy is playing in 1857 before there even is a world championship. Um, so a little bit more about Morphy. Uh, he kind of treats chess as a casual hobby, despite his great talent. Um, he practices to become a lawyer. Then eventually, right, he graduates from law school and has a little bit of time before he can actually be legally of age to practice. And so he starts playing chess more seriously. He goes to the first American Chess Congress in New York City and wins it. And in fact, only in the course of the tournament, plays probably 20 to 25 games and only loses two, right? Most of them were either wins or draws. Um, so he becomes, from being a New Orleans sensation, becomes a national sensation, right? Goes on to Europe to play all of the best players in Europe who were generally much stronger than the best American players and absolutely lays them all the waste as well. Ironically, even though he plays all these amazing games against these strong masters, it is this game at the Paris Opera House 
for which he is often best remembered. And um, that's basically, if I had to explain why, I would say it's because the principles of chess and the art of how to play a game well are very well demonstrated in this game. Um, you can learn a lot by studying the details of this game, even though it is very simple and very short. Um, and it's also very exciting. So anyway, uh, more than enough preamble, I'm sure. But that's a little bit of a sense of the who and the what of what it is we're looking at, okay? So beyond that, I'm gonna get a little step a little bit closer to actually looking at this game. There are a few concepts that I wanna look at briefly before we actually look at the game because those concepts are going to come up. Okay, so the first one is what is actually often referred to as the opera mate. Okay, so this is an incredibly pared down position, right? Hopefully everybody here at least knows how the pieces move or frankly, I may have to do a different lecture for you. <laughs> um, but if anyone you know, wants to contribute, cares to contribute, right? What should white play here for checkmate in one? Not very hard to find. Feel free to un, you know, chime in. Anybody? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Uh, how about uh, uh, rook to h8? Thank you. Rook to h8. So, okay, so what's going on here? So the king cannot move, right, for a variety of reasons, okay? Number one, he can't take the rook because, of course, the bishop guards, all right? He can't flee to, say, h7 because the rook also holds that square or f8, he would still be in check from the rook, okay? The pawn occupies f7, and of course, g7 is also taken up by the bishop, right? So this is a simple, simple checkmate pattern, but one that we're going to see come back at the end of the game in actually a mirror image, okay? So that's, that's element one. Okay, element two, this is a little bit more of a complicated position, but we have the idea of line clearing. Okay, so what the heck is line clearing? Well, if you look at this position for a second, you can see that white has an immediate problem. And if you can't see it, well, I'm demonstrating it now, which is that the rook is threatening to take the bishop. Now, if we move the bishop back, black has a really strong move, which is to play rook to b1 which checks the king and actually picks up the piece, right? White will save his king and we will win a piece on the very next turn, right? The same problem exists in a slightly different form if he plays bishop c1, right? Which is the rook comes down, pins the bishop, all right? Another concept that we need to explore. The bishop cannot move because it would expose the king to check, okay? And so again, the piece is lost. So with that in mind, anybody uh, think they can find how white solves his problems here? What can we do? We've got to somehow bring in a helper. Yeah. Pawn to C3. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate it. Right, so yeah, so this is the idea that we're looking at, right, of line clearing, okay, that the pawn moves out of the way, and now we notice actually neither the bishop nor the rook moved, but nonetheless, the situation has changed. Now, if the rook wants to capture, he's gonna have to pay a price, okay? So this is another concept that we'll see in the game, this idea of neither piece involved actually moving, but removing the obstacle between them to create a relationship where one didn't exist, okay? And then the last one, and then we'll finally get to the meat of the thing, okay, is x-ray protection. So um, we have a third position, okay? Again, white is in danger of losing a piece. And unfortunately, there's no safe square to run away to, 
because we notice, okay, the bishop has a lot of them covered. Okay, and then we're getting a little bit uh, complicated with lines here, but right, the knight cannot travel here or here, and this pawn covers the other two. So it looks like the piece will be lost. But White finds a really clever idea here, which is to play bishop c3. And now this bishop sort of defends the knight, even though there's a piece in between. Because of course, if the dark squared bishop were to move and take, now suddenly we see the sphere of protection extended, right? And um, we can recapture, okay? So very quickly, right, we have a simple checkmate pattern. We have <clears throat> this idea of removing the obstacle to open lines. And we have this idea of protection through pieces. Anybody completely lost? That's all I'm interested in, <laughs> is if you just have absolutely no idea what's going on and feel over your head already, because I can stop and try and explain these things in more detail. Testing my microphone here. This is Steve. Can you hear? Hey, Steve. I can hear you fine. Uh, so I, I would have uh, considered, I mean, it doesn't uh, follow the point you were trying to make, but I would have considered right. bishop to f2 to, ah. to put pressure in, the, in, in that way instead. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is a great idea. Okay, so um, this actually leads to another thing that is really helpful. Thank you. Questions are incredibly useful. Um, which is that a lot of beginning players, right, I know how the pieces move and I'm trying to get my way towards really playing. They, they put a little bit too much stock in checks. So, for example, right, well, uh, you know, how bad could Bishop F2 be? Because it's a check, right? And it's very satisfying, of course, to say check as well. It has that benefit, <laughs> right? Um, but after Bishop F2, yeah, the king's in danger. The problem is that I can play a move like, say, king to b8, and now you don't have any good follow-up checks. The only check of any um, even worth discussion is bishop to a7, and the king would just capture you, right? You'd lose a piece. And which is worse, we've now lost the opportunity to x-ray defend the knight, right? Because now you see, for example, bishop d4, which does defend the knight, no longer works because the bishop can just take us instead. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. But yes, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And more contributions are welcome because I, you know, keep in mind for all of you, thank you again for coming. I'm thrilled um, at such participation, but I don't know most of your skill levels. Um, I have some general sense. So the things that are confusing to you, I'm not necessarily gonna know unless you, I hear from you. So thank you for that. Okay, at last. Okay, one more, one more bit of discussion, I lied. <laughs> There's one more thing that I want you to keep in mind, okay? Probably the most useful thing that you'll learn today if you're just trying to dip your feet into how to play this game, which is that there are three major guiding principles for how to play, okay? And I'll try and introduce them succinctly so we can get on with it. The first one is development. And basically, the best way to demonstrate this concept is that your pawns, while very valuable and an important part of the game, don't actually contribute that much to the winning of the game in comparison with what are called the pieces. So we refer to these fellows on the back rank, okay, the rooks, the knights, the bishops, the king and queen as the pieces, and the pawns we refer to as the pawns. Development is the idea of getting as much of your army out as quickly as possible so that essentially you get there what's that famous quote get there firstest with the mostest right this is the basic idea of development um, so we're going to be very mindful as we look at this game of how black continually wastes time and morphe playing white is ruthlessly efficient at getting things into play okay principle two center control this one's a little easier I think if you have any game experience, right, the center of the board allows you the shortest distance to any particular place that you wanna go. So who owns the center tends to control the rest of the board as well. And then principle three, also a little bit easier, king safety. 
it's really important to make sure that you keep your king safe because hopefully you already know if the king is checkmated, the game's over. It doesn't matter what else is happening. Okay, here we go, at last. Morphe opens with e4, okay? Um, a very typical move. So we control two center squares. Well, I, to be more precise, one center square and one square that's near the center. We uh, help the development of our king's bishop and our queen, right? And, um, and we get closer to castling kingside, right? <laughs> which is the fastest way to castle which again, when we look at efficiency and trying to get our pieces out, this makes sense. So this move is so good. Black says, I have no interest in trying to be creative. I will match you. Okay. All right. Now, there's lots of ways to play from here. Okay. Lots of ways to play from here. But the generally most agreed upon thing to do is just develop your king's knight and attack the pawn. This opening has been played, you know, a million times, probably more. Um, and this is sort of always agreed upon as being the best move because as we talk about principles, we are developing, that's principle one. We are actively fighting for control of the center, principle two. And like I said before, we're getting closer to castling, king safety, principle three. Okay. Black now makes a move which is perfectly fine, but is a little bit against principle, which is that he plays pawn to d6. Okay, so as we already talked about, right, we want to be trying to develop our pieces. We've defended the pawn, but we're not necessarily aiding our development. We notice as one specific example that the king's bishop is now kind of shut in. All right. Um, what, I mean, I assume at least Bill will come very quickly with this, but what's the typical move to defend this pawn? What can black usually do? Well, I'm completely ignorant about the typical move, but uh, you could play uh, <clears throat> knight to uh, c6. Knight to c6, right? Which, as we've seen, is kind of still following along this good for the goose, good to, for the gander approach, right? Like, okay, well, if you're going to develop your knight, I can develop mine, right? There is also the idea of developing a complete mirror image, right? This is a little bit less typical because... Um, well, for one thing, it's usually a good idea to try and create some imbalance in the position if you want to try and win, but also because black can get into trouble uh, after, for example, knight takes. If black just tries to keep playing this uh, mirror image idea, he can get into some trouble after something like queen e2, where if we just, oh, I'll just drop my knight back, suddenly there's a nasty attack on the king coming and white can play for example knight to c6 right which making sure everybody follows the queen is checking the king so the knight is untouchable and we're going to pick up the queen okay morphe's very aggressive uh, he has no interest in playing closed games he was actually a pretty fair positional player he could do the locked up thing but he really really thrived when he smashed things open as much as possible and all the pieces were flying around. So with that in mind, right, he plays now pawn to d4. Okay, putting pressure on this pawn that he's already attacking and now threatening to win it again because he's only defended once and we're attacking it twice. Okay, black now plays um, a bad move, but actually a very typical move for the time, which is he plays bishop to g4. And here's where we have our first pin, okay, of the game. So this is not especially significant, but it's worth understanding that the knight now is frozen because, of course, if the knight moved, the bishop would win the queen. Can I toss in a quick question, John? Yeah, please. You said it was a typical move of the time. Could you talk a little more about, like, the development of tactics and why people played that, even though it's now considered a bad move? Yeah, so thank you for that. Okay, so... Um, you know, the, the merits of this move, I think, are actually fairly clear. I will point them out, but I think it's easy to understand why players at the time enjoyed it. First of all, it's fairly aggressive. We are definitely trying to cause problems for white right at the beginning of the game. And 
one of the problems we're causing is that you know his attack on our pawn is sort of temporarily delayed but we also you know maybe can put some pressure on this center pawn by developing further and trying to gain control of this square because the knight is no longer going to be helpful in controlling it the flaw is a little bit more interesting that has nothing to do with it that's just a misclick forgive me <laughs> the flaw is as we're going to see a little bit later in the game that this move creates a weakness on the queen side right the pawn used to be home and is guarding this square and now that it's out we're going to find that actually white is able to put a surprising amount of pressure on black and cause a surprising amount of problems just from this one weakness and then actually the one more thing i would add is this early move out of the bishop is going to lead to the bishop being exchanged as we'll see in a moment and this bishop not being on the board is probably the single biggest issue the fact that the light squares okay the light squares of the board all over the place become a little bit harder for black to defend because he doesn't have this light squared bishop and all of that's going to be a little bit clearer as i make it concrete so i will i'll sort of punt on a further explanation of that is that somewhat helpful matt yes for me <laughs> okay thanks okay all right, so here's the thing. Morphy finds immediately a clever way to deal with this pin, okay? He notices that the queens, as usual, are in opposition, and that if he can trade this queen off, the knight will no longer be pinned, and he'll be able to resume his attack on e5. So does anybody see a way to, number one, open more lines, right? Get the position even more open. Remember who this guy is. And create a possibility for a queen exchange. You take pawn, uh, pawn takes, uh, what is that, uh, e e5? Pawn takes e5. Yes, this is exactly right. Right. He says, all right, I'll just rip this file open. Okay. Files being the line from one player to the other. Okay. And if black takes back obediently, Morphe says, all right, I'll just trade the Queens. I don't care about material. Right. And now no more pin. Knight takes no e5. More castling. No more castling uh, as well. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Right. And you know, black will play back intelligently to E6, but white's one a pawn. Black can't castle, right? Morphe's already in the driver's seat, okay? So these guys aren't the best players in the world, but they're not terrible. They find a nice little uh, in-between idea, which is they say, okay, instead of just obediently taking back, what if I take here? Okay, and now, in reality, actually, both moves are correct, believe it or not, here for white. Both reasonable options are correct, but... In the interest of talking about principle, what would be the most principled way to get your piece back? Anybody who suggests something other than getting your piece back, I'm just going to tell you right now, you've got the wrong idea, right? So we've got queen captures F3 and we've got G captures F3, right, with the pawn. What makes more sense given these ideas of development and central control? Queen takes bishop. Of course. Right? Queen takes bishop makes more sense. Okay? In reality, there was some later analysis of this game which suggested actually he could play GF and then after this, right, something like this and we're attacking over here and we can play F4 coming up and White's still better. Right? That's how much better his position is. But I think we're trying to learn from the romantic school and how to play for early checkmates. So we want to keep the queens on <laughs> as much as possible. Okay, so queen f3, black gets his pawn back, not much to say there. White says, okay, more development, bishop c4, and also threatening checkmate in one, right? If black does nothing or ignores the threat, that's the game. All right, we're done. So, uh, at this moment, right, probably the best thing to do would be actually for black to play queen f6 himself, right? 
and offer the queen trade because he's starting to come under a lot of pressure. But he plays another very reasonable move, right? It doesn't seem like there's anything wrong in it, which is to play knight to f6. Okay, this, of course, blocks the attack, right? The queen can no longer reach. And she can't, you know, get around him, right, to try and come in this way because the knight guards that square. Okay? All right. We're getting to a key move of the game. This game, by the way, is, I believe, 17 moves. Um, so we're, you know, now on move six. <laughs> and uh, we now get to kind of a key moment which is, if you remember, Matt, I had talked about the weakness of this square, okay? And how the bishop coming out, right, created some issues with it being traded off. And so now, Morphe finds a really cool move which does not develop at all, but renews the attack by switching directions, right? And he plays queen to b3, okay? Tagging b7, Okay, giving him an immediate problem. But there's also another threat, right? Say I play pawn to b6, right, and just deal with it. That doesn't seem so bad. Does anybody see where Morphe's follow-up is? The, the, that... Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the, the bishop from c there all the yep. way up to f7. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Right? Bishop to f7. Okay, very good. And uh, yeah, and after the king moves, can you see what we can even do then to make things still worse? Well, the queen can go to e6. Very good. Yeah, queen to e6, and that's checkmate. Again, game over. And actually, uh, anybody who noted, right, king to d7, right, would have also been a possible response. But turns out it's just as much a mate. Okay, so this b7 pawn is sort of an issue, but the real problem is we're going to get mated. Okay, all right, so we've got probably two moves that stop this, right? We've got queen e7, which was played in the game, and we've got queen d7. Now, I want to just look at queen d7 for a quick second, and then we'll keep moving. All right, the problem with queen d7 is that it hangs this b7 pawn, right? And now after this clever move of queen to c6, trying to save the rook by x-ray protection, right? If queen a8, then queen a8. Does anybody see there's a pin here that's really nasty that wins the game for white? How about bishop to b5? Bishop to b5 is exactly right. Thank you. Right. Okay, the queen is hit. The king uh, is behind her, so she can't move. So even though there's seemingly a free queen here, right, on sale, it doesn't matter. The only legitimate option is either to move something else and allow the queen to be captured or queen b5, queen b5, right? And again, black is hopelessly lost, right? We've dropped the queen and white is still attacking. All white needs to do is finish his development and then club us to death, okay? So queen d7 doesn't work because any effort to save the rook loses the queen. And if we do anything else, right, white will just take the rook on a8, okay? And again, we'll be down a lot. John, can I ask a question here? Yes, you can. You can always ask a question. This is where I'd be totally screwed because, uh, you know, our friends, uh, uh, lately in Russia would spend, they wouldn't bother with this position because they know what to do, but they would spend a couple of minutes analyzing, is, uh, did Morphe's opponent likely look at D7, you think, and then say no bad move? Because his other moves have not necessarily suggested he was that strong an opponent. So was it just pure fortune that he picked E7? You know, actually, so I've done a little bit of research into this. Um, and I wanted to keep the first lecture somewhat efficient, but um, so Count Isouard, by everything I can tell, is sort of just a rank amateur and, you know, the rich guy along for the ride. But the Duke of Brunswick actually was a very serious chess player. Um, <clears throat> so he he's apparently, you know, was rarely seen except at the chessboard. He didn't have Morphe's talents, but I think it's reasonable to assume that he was putting a lot of effort into this game. And I think, yeah, and... 
And the other reason I'll, I'll say that I think he had thought about it was the move that he comes up with in Queen E7 also has sort of a clever idea. Um, it's, not, it's probably the best move in the position. And the idea is very simple, which is now after Queen E7 and this battery that's being built here with the bishop, okay, if Morphy takes on B7, yep. Black has a chance to play Queen B4, which forces the exchange of queens. Now, black still is down a pawn, right? You're playing against the best player in the entire world at the height of his powers. So black will still probably be lost, but it's a heck of a lot better than getting mated in 17 moves, which is what happened, right? So I, I think, you know, there's reason to assume that there's at least some talent there, um, but uh, yeah, not, not enough. <laughs> um, so, Again, we're in the Romantic era. Um, this is not the modern day where people win a pawn and then grind people into dust in the most boring game ever, right? Morphe says, okay, I, I want nothing to do with the queens coming off the board, right? I have no interest in that. I want to play a Romantic game full of sacrifice and interest. And so he just plays knight to c3, where now queen to b4 doesn't do anything. There's no check. And we can just go back to our old idea of taking on f7. Right. And again, we're going to ravage his kingside and he can't castle and, you know, bad things are happening. Okay. So black doesn't bother, right? He plays a nice move, which is to defend his B pawn by X-ray protection and plays pawn to C6. This has a bonus of keeping the knight out of some useful squares as well. Okay, but most importantly, we're no longer, you know, hanging the pawn and then maybe hanging the rook as a result. Okay. This is a reasonable moment. We've made it to, uh, to move eight. What's a reasonable principled thing for white to do here? Nothing crazy. I'm just asking for, you know, just find something that seems to make sense with getting more pieces into play. How about castling? Castling? Perfectly reasonable, right? Now remember that you're incredibly aggressive and you love <laughs> very exciting, dramatic play. But move, move the uh, bishop. bishop. Yeah. Okay. So where? Sorry, somebody go made ahead. a little crosstalk. Well, you could go to G5. Yeah, bishop G5. Yeah. Excellent, right? So the difference between these two moves is, is useful to understand, right? Castling is great. Castling is what I yell at all my nine-year-old students that they ought to be doing more often, right? It's incredibly important, but it's more important to set problems for your opponent, right? And Morphe's king is not actually in any real danger right now. As long as he continues to throw punches and throw curveballs at black, he's not going to have to worry about his king. Now, he also had another plan in mind for his king, so we'll see that in a minute. So bishop g5 is kind of annoying. You're saying, okay, black has exactly one piece that's developed to its normal square, and I'm now making it useless. By the way, this is a really good moment for me to pause. I have to remember, I, I did not mention the cost of this move, okay? Which is that you can see with the queen on e7, the bishop on f8 is trapped. It's going to take at least a couple more moves for the bishop to get out. And with the bishop on f8 trapped, right, the king is prevented from castling, right? And this is usually where I throw in the joke that the green grass grows all around, all around, right? One bad piece can cause a ripple effect of bad positioning throughout the entire rest of the, the game, right? So as long as Morphe has black sort of in this difficult spot of this lack of kingside development, he's essentially going to be playing as if these two pieces were safely off the board. He's essentially a rook and a bishop up already. So keep that in mind with what follows. Okay. Black says, okay, I've got to do something to try and regain control of this game, right? Knight to d7, just simply developing, is going to go back to hanging b7 because we've blocked the defense of the queen. Right, and knight to a6 probably would still lead to problems after bishop takes and um, black's pawns are, are broken up, right? Which 
that's getting a little bit more advanced, but essentially for people who are new to some of this stuff, I would say you just notice the fact that pawns defend diagonally. <clears throat> so suddenly you went from a very nice pawn structure all in a row to three ragged looking pawns that can't defend each other at all. So all three of these are probably going to now be easily picked up as the game winds towards an end game. So black doesn't like you know, either one of these options. So he says, okay, I've got a clever idea. I'm gonna play B5 and I'm gonna smack you in the face. <laughs> okay, hoping for white to be very meek and just play back to Bishop D3, at which point, right, if, if white were obeying his wishes, he could maybe now try Queen to E6, right? Trying to get the Queens off the board. Or maybe we go back even better probably would be Queen to B4 trying to force the queens off the board, right? And if white takes, hooray, I've solved my problems. Everything's looking a heck of a lot better. I've got some funny looking pawns, but that's not gonna be enough to really set me the kind of problems I had previously, okay? So hopefully I'm giving it away enough. Bishop D3 is not what Morphe played. <laughs> He's way ahead in development. He's got four pieces out into the battle compared to Let's call it two, but even that's maybe being a bit generous, considering one of them's pinned and one of them's a bit awkward. Okay. What does Morphe play here? That's probably for you more experienced guys. Well, the, the only aggressive move I can see him making is, uh, is a bishop takes knight. Yeah. yeah like that like this? I'm not sure what good that does, but I mean, at least it, I, I agree. it was one of the pieces. Yeah, I think, I think Bishop takes Knight, right? You've taken away a problem for him, right? You've exchanged off one of your useful attacking pieces and you've cleared the way for the Bishop to develop again. That's true. Right? That's good though. Thank you for, you know, I appreciate the, uh, the participation. No one is obliged to participate, but it helps. Anybody have a, a different guess? Remember, the romantic era. Yeah. Life is cheap. <laughs> well, the, the, the bishop on C4 could take the pawn on B5 because... Great. Now we're getting somewhere. Because, Absolutely. Because then if the pawn takes the bishop, then the queen takes the pawn and there's check. Yes. I you, guess. you have absolutely the, um, the rudiments of the idea. So what I would go back to in order to make this a little clearer is if we remember 10 moves ago, um, <clears throat> probably not, probably five moves ago, um, Black got rid of his light squared bishop. And when we're talking about chess, right, getting to very general principles again, it's really useful to have things that your opponent doesn't have, right? And so... When Morphe makes the decision to sacrifice, which is what I mean, you've absolutely got the right spirit here, right? You're learning how to play 19th century chess. He wants to hang on to the bishop because black is going to have a much harder time defending against the bishop of the color he doesn't have than a knight of which he still has two, even though admittedly one of them is a bit hampered at the moment, okay? So Morphe says, not the bishop sack, oh. but the knight. <clears throat> And now after pawn takes bishop d7, and we see already his options are very limited. Okay, so just as a quick, I'm going to run through this quickly, right? Um, knight takes, or knight blocks the check this way, of course, hangs the queen, right? Don't forget about the pin. Okay, um, king out, loses the right to castle, but also runs very neatly into even more development, right? Castling queenside. And this is gonna be a quick game. Okay, the king's stuck in the center, all of white's pieces are raging. And of course, I mean, queen blocking is just silly, right? So the only real move that's afforded is knight to d7. Fortunately, this doesn't look too bad. And now, even more development. What does Morphe do now? He's not ready to win the game. And don't exchange pieces, Bill. Is it that queenside castle now? Indeed, thank you, right? So this, as we notice, it was worth waiting for, right? Because kingside castling doesn't actually bring another piece into the attack, 
And so by waiting a bit to castle, Morphe is able to get everything he wants. I secure my king and I pressurize this d7 knight, right? There's even more here. Okay, black's move is easy. There's only one move that offers any further defense to his beleaguered position, right? So he plays rook to d8. And now there's one lonely piece not yet participating. <laughs> one left, okay? One left. How do we get him into the game? And again, remember that it is the 19th century and you're only gonna live to 45 anyway. That's an exaggeration, but <laughs> trying to have fun here. What do you think? Uh, D1 to D7, go ahead and throw that rook away and then there we go. be prepared right. to bring in the other. <laughs> so you've hit the nail on the head, Andrew, thank you. But, um, but I'm gonna back up a second, right? I think most people that I give this position to try first either rook to d2, okay, and planning to rook bring the rook in behind. Or even more often, actually, I get people playing rook to e1. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Right. And what I always want to remind people, thank you, this is excellent. I always want to remind people with things like this. Look, I'm not, I'm not denying that this is in the game, right? It's in the game and it's supporting your center. But I think we can all agree that it's not in the attack right? This rook is not participating in the attack on the king unless, you know, we make a couple more moves. Like maybe we play f4, but even then black has to be game enough to take so that we can push our pawn up the board, right? Like we're going to need a little bit of cooperation from him to make this move have teeth, okay? Far more exciting to say in for a penny, in for a pound. I'm already down one piece, right? Let's sack even more material. Remember, as long as you have one arm tied behind your back, I'm still up. So rook to d7 is exactly in the spirit. You would have made a fine romantic, Andrew, but I think we knew that already. All right. Um, okay, again, we have, you know, very limited options for captures, right? Knight takes, hey, uh, again, still hanging out here, right? Still causing problems, okay? Queen takes, runs into bishop, takes queen. Rook takes is really the only option um, there's no not taking here. Your queen is hit, right? There's far too much going on. Okay, so rook comes in. And now, you know, this is finally, hopefully, an easy move for everybody. Um, we're still not ready to finish the game. Okay, what do we do? Somebody maybe we haven't heard from? Rook to d1. Thanks, Chip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? He's not in any... He's, well, in some ways he is in a hurry, right? I suppose that's not totally fair, but in quite another way, right? It's really important to say, I want to bring absolutely everyone into the game before I try and win it. Okay, so rook to d1, bringing the last element into the game, okay? Putting pressure on the rook on d7 again, okay? And preparing the final sacrifice, which is really cool and I'm actually going to leave up to let you try and figure out. So I'm not checking my chats. Ah, okay, good. Yes. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> okay. Um, Black tries his last desperate gamble, okay, which is to play queen to e6, hoping again for the obedient trading of queens which honestly would actually probably still be losing for black, but he has better chances with the queens off than he does otherwise, right? Um, and now here's where Morphe has a combination to win the game, all right? So I'd love to, you know, have somebody, maybe you've seen this game already and, you know, this is all spoiled for you, but if we can try and work this out, I think that's pretty cool. What I'll offer you as a hint is to go back to the beginning and say that this pattern of the rook and the bishop coordinating is at the heart of this thing, okay? And if you can remember that, then maybe you can start thinking about how you're gonna bring that situation about where you can make that pattern a reality, okay? So I'll give you two minutes here and see if anybody can 
but uh, maybe challenge yourselves. Again, this, I got through this thing way faster than I even thought. So uh, maybe challenge yourselves to try and see the whole thing, right? Don't just play one move and then kind of figure, you'll figure it out when you get there. That's, uh, that's not the best way to play chess. No wonder I don't play well. <laughs> yeah. This is, the, by the way, actually, to cover people, hopefully people have some thinking time here. Um, I will say that's one of the problems I have with doing tactics on online programs as opposed to buying a tactics book, you know, which I highly recommend and happy to give the names of for people. Um, is, you know, uh, look, whatever you can have access to is great, but I find sometimes with computer chess tactics programs and things, they kind of encourage you to just throw a move at it. And then the program says, right or wrong, right? And you kind of get into this spirit of just trying things, which of course um, is great for exploring, but in a real game, you get exactly one shot and then it either worked or it didn't and you know, you're in trouble. So what's usually a lot better is to try and work on things with paper and pencil or you know, somewhere where you can't move the pieces and have to kind of force yourself to think about things a little bit more. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll maybe, um, we can talk about that in a little post-game discussion about resources and things. Um, one more thing before I cut to the ending here. Um, this website, Lee Chess, is amazing. Uh, it's completely free. It has tons of practice resources and articles and ways to get better. And of course, uh, you know, opponents uh, 24 hours a day. So, um, Chess.com is great. I teach a lot of the time on chess.com, but I, I will say um, it's the kind of capitalist paid version. So uh, where chess.com has advertisements, you know, unless you pay a certain amount and, oh, you can't have access to that feature unless you, right? Lee Chess is completely free. Um, and, you know, by all means donate to them. They're wonderful. But um, for people who are just trying to dip their feet in without, you know, knowing if it's worth money to them or not, I would say Lee Chess is absolutely fantastic. Go make yourself a username, challenge me a game, you know, any, anything you want. I obviously uh, have a fair amount of time right now, as I think we all do. Okay, anybody have any idea? Uh, bishop takes rook, perhaps? Okay, bishop takes rook is how it starts. Bishop takes rook is how it starts. Um, we notice that the only legitimate option after bishop takes rook is probably knight takes, mm -hmm. right? Which helps our friends now see to the back of a theater, okay? The bishop on g5 can now reach all the way to d8, which is going to be important if you're paying attention to the pattern. But then what? Let's, let's go ahead and put that on board. I'll, I'll do you a solid. <laughs> Oh, and then uh, uh, queen to b8. Queen to b8. This is the fun one, okay? What good is playing chess if you don't get a chance to ditch your queen? <laughs> okay, um, this is fabulous, right? I have had a few opportunities to ditch my queen in my chess career, and it's, it's always a really special feeling, okay? So we notice suddenly the relevance of the bishop reaching to the back of the theater is clear, right? Because the king has no squares. He has no option to run. There's no not taking the queen. Now, anybody who misses what's going on might say, why would I not want to take the queen anyway? Well, the problem is after the knight moves, now everybody sees to the back of the house. Okay, and I hope this one's easy for everybody, right? Rook to d8 is checkmate. And I just want you to notice as one final little thing on this game, um, how unbelievably efficient it is, <laughs> right? We have just enough to mate you left on the board and black with four different pieces, one of which is his queen idly standing by with their hands in their pockets, <laughs> right? I think that's, I, I don't know. it. it it's important to learn how to be materialist at chess and, and to play like a banker, right? Where 
um, never giving a pawn away for nothing. And because it's very easy to lose that way, right? You can lose boring. Um, people grind you down, like I made reference to earlier. But I think if you want to enjoy chess, if you want to get into chess being something that's really fun for you, and you want to grow to be a more advanced player, you always want to start first with attacking ideas. They're just more fun um, and more dramatic. And you can go back and you can look at games from 1750, right, and see how they were doing things where looking at, for example, Bill, I know you're following the candidates tournament right now, um, which yeah, is... Not good. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, excuse me. Right. The candidates tournament that's not happening right now because there's a <laughs> pandemic. But um, this is the tournament for who will play Magnus for the world championship. Those games are fascinating, but, you know, most of them are draws and they're being played at a really high level. And there's an awful lot of why didn't he do that? Well, it turns out the reason he didn't do that is because five years ago, so-and-so tried that, and there was this very famous game where he got bludgeoned, right? And, and so there's just, it's so incredibly thick with history and theory that I think as a starting place for people who are really just trying to develop an enthusiasm, it's really kind of lousy. I really recommend, you know, get yourself um, a book of simple tactics, little things like some of the stuff I even did at the beginning, line clearing and x-ray protection, right? Play tons of games. And if you're going to study games, try and look at, you know, attacking stuff from any era. I don't care if it's, you know, necessarily Paul Morphy. Um, but that's what I, I recommend. Um, okay, great. That's wonderful. Uh, hopefully, you know, somebody got something out of that. Uh, what questions does anybody have? I mean, this can be about the game. They can be about chess in general, you know, best practice. Um, you know, my theater career is on hiatus, so we won't be taking questions on that, uh, <laughs> regrettably. But, you know, anything that's related to, uh, to this stuff, you know. I have, I have a slight meta question. Yeah, please. Um, let's say it's you, John, playing me for the sake of argument. Um, let's say it, when and where. Well, I'm, my point being, to your, 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 okay, I'm sorry. I, I guess that I have a preliminary question. Is, is your first, uh, is your first thought that uh, if you're going to lose early on, you might as well lose big. So play attacking chess. Secondly, given that you're you and I'm me, um, does it make sense for the much stronger player to play more aggressively uh, and attempt to win sooner because uh, against a stronger player, that aggressiveness could blow up in his face. Got it. Yeah. Okay, great. So, I, yes. Okay, that's a very good question. What I would say to that is um, there's a story. So there's this guy, Dan Heisman, like Heisman Trophy. Um, Dan Heisman is a, a master and a, a chess coach and really an awesome guy for anybody who's just starting out, right? He's like... Very much, he helped me a lot uh, a number of years ago and, and that kind of thing. I just, I love his articles. So Dan Heisman, you can look him up. But he has this story where he talks about being a Philadelphia champion, right? He, he won the Philadelphia State Championship. And he went out to this bar and, you know, his friend was there. And they kind of like hustled this friend of a friend into playing a chess game with him. And this guy thought he was pretty good. And he played Dan and they played a pretty tough game and Dan beat him, and, and the guy was very frustrated, right? And Dan, of course, did the big reveal, like, hey, listen, I'm a master, I just won the Philly championship. And the guy was, you know, everything was forgiven, he thought it was funny, you know, it was great, I'd love to play you again. The interesting part of the story is, Dan said, the guy played way worse the second time. Huh. That second game was way less interesting because now he had it in his head that he was playing this great player and he kind of started pulling his punches, right? And worrying too much about the consequences. Um, it is definitely true up to a certain level, but it's pretty universally true. Even grandmasters, as well as they defend, they are more comfortable attacking. So you should always be trying to find a way to be on the attack. Right now, over time, you'll learn what doesn't work and you'll go splat as I like to refer to it. Right. And you'll realize what's too aggressive. 
but you have to keep that spirit because if you start sort of, you know, mm, I'm just going to castle because I don't really know, you're ceding the initiative to your opponent. You're giving them that space to say, I don't know, what do you want to do? And the opponent wants to win. <laughs> so they're going to start telling that story, right? And if now you start just defending their ideas and never having any of your own, you're still telling their story in a sense, right? You're, you're not starting to tell the other version where things go badly for them. So uh, I hope, you know, to make this totally explicit, you should always try and hit me with as much difficulty as you possibly can because you'll learn more and you'll have more fun um, than, you know, than you will sort of staying at home. Does that answer your question? Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, what else? Anybody else? I have a, yeah. I have a history question, kind sure. of. And well, we're, we're from New Orleans and so I guess Paul Morphine's from New Orleans. Have, have you ever been to New Orleans and played a guy named Jude Acer, who is on uh, Decatur Street? Have you ever I heard have, of Jude Acers? I, I have not had the pleasure. I will tell you oh. that I have been to New Orleans and played chess in New Orleans. And I will also tell you a weird story about when I went to New Orleans. So I went to New Orleans shortly after uh, the Saints won the Super Bowl in 2009 because James Bartell, who's a friend of mine and, and Andrews, um, and I had a conversation and he invited me to come. That's a whole story. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went down there and, uh, and I was there. Everyone that I was there to see was busy uh, that first day. And so I sort of found myself wandering around the center of town with nothing to do. And there was a mausoleum not far from... from um, from the French Quarter. And I went walking over there to check it out because I'm a macabre sort of person. And, uh, and I went walking in and there was a tour being run in there by someone, uh, you know, going through the various graves. And I sort of ended up because of how narrow it is in the mausoleum, ending up at the back of this tour. Again, with no real mission at all, you know, just sort of wandering around trying to kill time. And the tour guide kind of took exception to me walking behind them. And after about five or 10 minutes was like, excuse me, are you with the tour? Are you, are, you know, are you, are you gonna be you know, trying to participate? And I turned at that moment and said, no, I'm not with the tour. That's Paul Morphy's grave, I'm here to see him. <laughs> and I had sort of just, I don't know, wandered into this mausoleum and come across Morphe's grave, which is very grand. His family had some money. Um, and of course there are chess pieces on it all the time that people leave, frequently just plastic ones. Um, but I actually took a rubbing of the, of the grave, which of course, you know, now it's somewhere in my apartment. But it was just kind of a really special moment for me, you know, that I just kind of wandered with no particular goal into that particular place so you can go see it you know it's still there um and uh probably very socially distant at this particular moment <laughs> um, so I, re I recommend that you go check that out yeah because uh he's definitely um findable <laughs> um but uh yeah any anything else anybody cemeteries in new york are closed oh are they oh, oh yeah, I didn't that. yeah. Well, um, i don't know then yeah. Uh, quick question, John. Just, I guess, more about the culture of chess. Yeah. 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 As yeah. someone who's more steeped in the in the chess world, you talk a lot about like this. At this time, this move was popular, and um, and then you know players now who, um, you know, oftentimes it's a draw, and they're because they're you know thinking back like, oh, five years ago this move fucked me, so you know that's why I didn't do that. Um, forget my language. Yeah, that's all right. That's, uh, I'll just is, is, uh, see if I can scrub that part. <laughs> is there is there any is there any like in in the in the world of chess like uh, bad boys like guys you know players who are like oh well I'm gonna bring this move move back from you know 200 years ago or or you know screw it I'm gonna do this even though I know it might lead to this you know and everybody's like oh, he did what yeah you know, like yeah. is there any like that yeah. sort of a culture I'm just curious. okay I would say that your guy. Ross, your guy, um, his games are like ferociously complex, right? It's not a good entry point. But if I were going to talk about the players that you would love for their personalities, I would say um, Jose Raul Capablanca, 
okay, who was a Cuban uh, and world champion in around the turn of the 20th century, um, because he was a child prodigy. And so he had a very high opinion of himself and a lot of flair. Um, and then the other one that's really my favorite is Mikhail Tal. Um, so um, Tal was, uh, here, let me uh, show you this guy. <laughs> So Tal's nickname was the magician, right? And he was from Latvia. And this is pretty much how he was always seen, which is never without a cigarette. <laughs> and there's an, old, there's an old story about Tal that he, it's almost certainly apocryphal, but the story goes that he, uh, he first learned a Latvian version of chess in which knights couldn't go backwards because oh. because he never took backward moves you know like retreat was not a thing for tall and like thomas always would shoot them yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly very good yes thank you yeah he uh the the other really the great quote uh that tall coined is somebody was you know analyzing a position with him after some great win and he had three different pieces hanging, right? His rook, his knight, and his bishop are all just free, okay? And the guy says, Tal, you're hanging all your pieces. And he says, yes, but my opponent can only take them one move at a time. <laughs> so, I, you know, I would say um, Tal and maybe uh, Tony Miles. Oh, my God. Okay, hang on. One last. I'm getting going now. So, Tony Miles... Uh, was an English chess grandmaster. Okay, this is Tony Miles. And Tony Miles, uh, the reason I bring him up is because, oh man, I don't want to tell this story wrong, but he, he played against Karpov, like the world champion. Yeah, 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 okay. So he plays Anatoly Karpov, who's the world champion after Bobby Fischer. Okay, and that's all I'm gonna say about him. He's world champion. Okay, and Tony Miles is, has black in this game, and Karpov plays this, and Tony Miles plays a6. <laughs> and he wins the game. And, I, you know, I know this is, but, like, this move is nonsense, right? Like, everything we talked about, about center control and development and all this stuff, like, this move doesn't do any of that. And I can't help but think that part of what's going on here is just Tony Miles running a troll job. Um, so Tony Miles is another one that not the talent of tall, right? He was never world champion, but these are the guys who were kind of like, I don't really care what the computer says, even if I did look at it, right? Like, I don't care what's objectively best. You try and solve it now over the board and let's see how you do. Um, okay. I think, you know, unless somebody's got, you know, one more that they're dying to ask, I think that was probably plenty. Maybe, maybe, in the, maybe in the future sometime, if you do it again, you could do Bobby Fischer and the Sicilian defense. Would that ever be a future thing? Speaking sure. about Speaking about aggressive people with personality issues and- Yeah, and, yeah, we could and look at- the Sicilian at, uh, defense is kind of separate from the class, I guess. Yeah, maybe. well, uh, no, I'd be happy to look at, actually, you know, um, there are a couple of Fisher games that I was thinking about doing next anyway, because Fisher's more, you know, 1970s, 1960s, but still that romantic flavor of sack, 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 and, you know, everything's blowing up. And uh, so, yeah, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm already thinking about, you know, what I'll do next. Thank you all for okay, coming. Thank you, know, you very much. Thank yeah, you. Very you. welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Very all. good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good job. Thanks again. All right. Well, I'll talk to you all uh, soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks again.